Good afternoon, everyone. Hi, good afternoon. Hi. Hello, everyone. Thank you all for being here. Um, we're going to start with some um, kind of intros and orienting people to what to expect. Um, so my name is Allie Maneri. I'm one of the um, members of the uh, Early Career Professional Committee for Division 17. And my name is Martina Jones. Um, I am also a committee member, um, ECP committee member for Division 17. Awesome. So, as you all know, um, we are here for the um, first in, a, in the virtual, the first um, webinar for the Virtual Connection and Development Series. Um, so this session is about networking tips and strategies for ECPs. Um, just so you all are aware, um, the Early Career Professional Committee was just kind of reflecting on different ways that we can connect with um, other ECPs in Division 17, and this is one of the ideas that we came up with. Um, so just kind of a general mission um, for the Virtual Connection and Development Series um, is for the purpose of presenting timely and relevant networking and professional development opportunities, um, and for facilitating community building among early career professionals in the division. Um, so again, this is the first and hopefully what will become kind of an ongoing um, way of connecting and sharing information. Um, so today, we have about an hour together. Um, obviously, we're going to start with some of these intro um, kind of topics. Um, we'll let you know who your presenters are, so we'll do a bio for them. Then they're going to share a little bit about their experiences with networking. Um, and then there will be plenty of time for um, Q&A. Just so you all are aware, um, there's a chat function. Um, if you look in the right-hand corner, um, if you any questions that you may have, if you could type them into the chat function, um, then Marty and I will be able to kind of field those and we'll present those to the presenters. So we will have the presenters share first, and then after their um, conversations, we'll um, be able to answer what they'll be able to answer whatever kind of questions you have or kind of share their reflections and response. Um, if you have particular questions for one of the presenters, you can also indicate that too in your question. Um, so just to kind of orient us to what our topic for today is, um, this webinar is going to address a broad range of topics associated with networking, including benefits of networking, who to network with, and um, tips for networking effectively. Um, so as you all may also be aware, we're going to have um, an academician and a clinician. So different perspectives will be shared. Um, so we also may find that the experience is nearly. Um, and obviously the webinar is best suited for those experiencing difficulty with networking with diverse professional settings and across psychology fields. Um, we also talked a little bit about um, kind of ways that networking and mentoring um, may be similar and also may be different. Um, so this webinar is focused specifically on networking, so what you may find is there may be overlaps with um, mentoring as well. All right then. Um, so at this point, I want to go ahead and jump into presenting our wonderful presenter. So presenting the presenter. Um, I'm going to go ahead and read their, their bios. I'm sure this is just a small piece of the wonderful work that they do. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and start with um, Dr. Lance. So Melanie Lance is an assistant professor of counseling psychology at Louisiana Tech University. Her research interests include multicultural competence, counseling, and training, as well as training and professional issues in counseling psychology. Clinically, Melanie's interests include substance abuse and addiction, trauma, and social cultural issues such as race, social class, sexual orientation, and gender identity. Moving on to Dr. Valene Whitaker. Dr. Whitaker is an advanced fellow in mental health recovery substance services administration and training at the Edith North Rogers Memorial VA Medical Center in Bedford, Massachusetts. Her professional interests include multicultural competency and clinical practice and training, trauma recovery and student veteran adjustment and resiliency, and racially and ethnically diverse women's mental health issues and wellness. Um, these are our two presenters. They're going to be speaking to you, um, as Ali said, from the perspective of an academician as well as a clinician. Um, at this point in the presentation, I want to go ahead and transition into their narratives. So each presenter is going to be given an opportunity to speak for about ranging five to ten minutes about um, their experiences with networking. And as was described, 
please kind of earmark your questions for them as they're doing their talks. Um, and at the end of their talks today, you'll give a op you'll have an opportunity to answer any questions that you have for each one of the presenters. So at this time, um, I'm going to go ahead and transition with Dr. Lance, and she can speak to you a little bit about her experiences with networking. All right, thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I've been reflecting a lot on my experiences with networking as a result of um, being on this panel, and um, I felt kind of funny at first talking about my ne my networking experiences because I feel like in a lot of ways I've been very lucky, um, and I wanted to be able to offer something more than find some way to be lucky. Uh, so, so what were what are the tangible things? What did that luck look like? Um, and I think part of why I say I'm lucky is because I was, um, I had some incredible opportunities to be very involved in APA and Division 17 from very early in my graduate career. And so the, the way specifically that I, I often feel that I'm lucky is the fact that I had the opportunities to be, to be there. Um, because if I had to boil down what the important things that I've learned about networking is, it's be present. Um, at places where networking can occur and be bold. Um, so having those opportunities early in my graduate career, I was often at places where there were people whom I would want to network with. And I have a, an early experience that I remember um, being struck by how important that was. And it actually drove a lot of the work that I wound up doing with the student affiliates at 17. Um, because I was presenting a poster at my first APA conference with a mentor and another person whose work I really admire came up to speak to my mentor and they were old friends and um, so they were chatting and very excited to see each other and and I was timid and quiet and then he went on his way and mentally I was like but wait wait no I, I want to meet you and and say hello but I, I was too timid at the time to say anything um, and so that was an opportunity that I lost to connect with someone, um, developmentally normal, I think, but still uh, you know, lost that opportunity. And um, so in that, in that instance, I was present. I was at APA convention um, and surrounded by people that I could network with. But if I had remained quiet, um, which is something that I struggle with, the boldness part, then, then I, I lose these networking opportunities. Um, and so I tried to, A, keep that in mind in facilitating networking opportunities for others, but also in my own interactions, that if I just kind of withdraw because I'm um, nervous about speaking to someone whose work that I really admire um, and, and just sort of you know, don't introduce myself or um, don't strike up a conversation, then that's, it, it's an opportunity loss. It's not going to happen. Um, and so through going to convention, through going... Um, to other conferences such as the Counseling Psychology Conference, um, I tried to do my best to set my to set my nervousness aside because I can still to this day have a sort of who am I to walk up to this person and take take a minute out of their day. Um, I do my best to try to put that aside to strike up conversations with people whose work I admire, whom I want to meet, um, other ECP colleagues who I really admire um, because in addition to you know what I'm kind of implicitly referring to is networking for mentorship, but there's um, you know mentoring or I mean um, networking for developing colleagues as well um, who are in a similar career stage. So. Um, I think the, the important pieces for me have been to be at the places where networking can occur and then engage that boldness. Um, to that end, I've always felt like there's a little bit of a potential disadvantage for people who can't be at convention. Who I mean, that especially came up when convention was in Hawaii, right? Um, like that's, it's, it's a privilege to be able to go to these conferences sometimes. Um, and I mean, depending on on the circles that you want to create, you can go to local conferences, regional conferences, but um, sometimes still going is a privilege, registration is expensive, travel is expensive. Um, and so recently to that end, I was on a webinar as a, um, as a participant, as an observer, on a grants webinar. Um, for me as an academician, that's something that is really important for me and that I, I really want to learn more about and could use more mentorship in. And I was struck by um, the individuals on the panel giving the same sort of uh, message that I'm giving now, which is be bold. If you are seeking 
to network with other researchers who have experience in um, grant writing if you um, you know are seeking mentorship in those areas be bold um, and it just so happened that one of the participants on that or one of the panelists on that webinar was someone whose work I really admired and whom I've never met uh, and so I was like all right I'm gonna be bold right now before I lose my uh, before I lose my gumption to do so and so I uh, emailed that person uh, to reach out and basically say you have never met me um, and I saw you on this uh, panel today and I really appreciated your input I'm wondering if you uh, might be willing to to talk with me um, and it was the first time that I had tried to network with someone who I'd never met face to face and um, and through purely an online platform and that person was um, really welcoming and we wound up having a great phone conversation um, maybe a couple of weeks after that and still in, in some communication and so um, once again that engaging that boldness uh, sometimes against my against my nature has been the the important piece for for at least for me in uh, developing that network and I've had some recent experience around um, being able to do that outside of conferences and conventions, which I think is important, again, given that it's sometimes a real privilege to be in those, to be able to be in those spaces. All right, and um, Dr. Lance, does that conclude your narrative and what you would like to share at this moment? I think so. I'll probably remember oh, some right. things later, but, <laughs> but at the moment, All yeah. All right, then. Thank you for sharing. Um, Dr. Whitaker, would you like to go ahead and begin? Oh no, Valine, we can't hear you. No. It's be a, ba a bad Verizon commercial. <laughs> <laughs> Can you hear me now? Mm -mm. I can continue to, to fill air in, in the meantime, in the absence of elevator music. Um, wait, Valine, are you back? Now? Yes. Yeah. yeah! All right, there you go. Okay. No elevator music needed. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. So in, in, an, in an effort to um, try to make sure that my background stayed quiet while Dr. Lance was speaking, I inadvertently seemed to completely shut myself off. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm glad that that worked out, and I'm, I'm back to join you all. Um, so, so I was saying that um, I, I loved Mel's example, examples and particularly the message to be bold because um, that definitely is something that I also uh, have had a hard time doing and I can identify with some of those experiences of um, attending conferences and kind of like fangirling out when you see an academic rock star, a professional rock star, somebody whose work you really admire. Um, so I, uh, I definitely can identify with that in particular because I see myself as a, um, I'm a pretty introverted person. Uh, so it takes a lot of uh, energy for me to um, be in social spaces for a prolonged period of time. Um, and I've had to figure out how to balance that with um, my own networking goals and my networking interests. Um, it's even taking a lot of energy for me to do this webinar. So probably after we hang up, I'm going to go and like, curl in a, a, a ball in my office and just like, <laughs> like just kind of be silent for a little while. <laughs> so, um, I, I particularly wanted to speak to the idea of networking as somebody who is in a full-time practice oriented position. Um, many of the ways that I networked in grad school coming from a research intensive um, counseling psych program were not um, translatable in the same ways. Um, when it came to kind of moving into a world where you're predominantly in practice and then particularly um, being in a setting like the VA where there are a lot of counseling psychologists who are employed um, and who are working and completing their training um, and at the same time for, for many uh, for many psychologists in general, there's this like regression towards the mean where everybody becomes kind of a VA psychologist. And um, you, you may lose some other kind of specific connections or partic particular um, kind of aspects in terms of your professional identity. Um, so for me, I've had to spend a lot of time figuring out um, ways to network based on my personality style, based on strengths, based on the career path that I've chosen at this point. 
Um, and so that's come in the form of a couple of different ways. Um, the first thing that I found it really important to do with networking is to start with the people in the places that I know. Um, so my first year at the VA, I was um, actually coming from doing my training, uh, previous training internship and a fellowship in a counseling center. So I feel like I got in a lot of great kind of mentoring, connected with a lot of people, made all of these wonderful um, uh, connections and built this professional network in California. And then I moved across the country to Massachusetts, where many of those professional connections <laughs> don't necessarily exist because they weren't local to me. Um, so I started with um, building and rebuilding relationships with peers and supervisors in my program, um, and also uh, thinking about ways to network with VA psychologists. And so for me, as a postdoctoral fellow my first year, that came in the form of doing um, kind of requesting brief meetings and doing some kind of informational interviews to ask people about their um, career trajectories and their particular professional interests. Um, I started in particular with folks um, on um, staff here who were counseling psychologists as well. Um, it just so happened that the first year that I was at the VA was the year of the counseling psych conference that Mel had mentioned happened a few years ago. And um, I came back all jazzed and excited and yes, I love counseling psychology and this is like my, my people. Um, and so I really wanted to know from the psychologists here, you know, what was it about counseling psychology that helped them to be a good fit for the VA? Um, that turned into other opportunities where people, you know, would say, oh, I remember you're, you asked me about this counseling psychologist thing, or I know that you have this interest in strength-based approaches, or I know that you really like, you know, your focus has been on diversity. Would you want to connect with me on this particular project? I think it'd be great if you meet this person. I think you should really check out this conference. And um, so that helped me to not only build confidence in networking because I was talking to the people that I knew to start or people that I kind of had a closer connection with. Um, but also, um, it, it helped me to learn a little bit more about the nuances of what counseling psychology could look like in my particular professional setting, which was the VA. Um, through a friend and a um, fellow postdoc, I was also invited to a networking group for other women of color psychologists, which I honestly never thought that I would find in the Boston area <laughs> and I was absolutely floored that there was this group of women who were getting together to connect around their shared experiences of being women of color and um, the the group my understanding is that historically it actually started very small it was actually started by Jessica Henderson Daniel who's going to be the next APA president um, she's the incoming president now um, it, it, it started small and I and I think that that kind of also speaks to the idea of starting with people in places you know. Start with the people in your home network and think about how those folks can help you to continue to, to grow and move uh, forward your own networking opportunities. Um, the next thing I'd probably share is to um, join things in general. <laughs> Joining things um, was, was very helpful for me. In, uh, in connecting and building a professional network, particularly because I moved to places where I didn't know people um, and I, I didn't have those kind of ready-made networks. Um, so if you have, if you find that you have some time and energy to do so, certainly first check in with yourself and see if joining things feels like a good use of your time and energy, particularly as a practitioner, where your schedule um, may be particularly impacted by having to sit with and absorb other other folks kind of experiences and um, you know balance that and think about what you need in terms of self-care. For me um, I felt particularly isolated professionally so it was really important for me to join things particularly in Division 17 because that really helped me to feel more connected it also helped me to grow a different kind of network. My network coming from grad school had focused predominantly on my research. And as a practitioner, I really wanted to connect with other practitioners in 17. So um, for me, that meant connecting with the ECP committee, other practitioners in the ECP committee, uh, also getting involved with a section on professional practice more recently. Um, and again, because 17 was familiar with me, that uh, familiar to me, that really helped me in terms of finding ways to network and, and speak to people. Um, I will also say from the perspective of a practitioner, joining your local state psych association can be really, 
useful. Um, you may find that there are other psychologists that you know from APA or from other spaces who are um, uh, in your state and are members of the, uh, your SPTA. And um, so, so joining a, kind of a, a local contingent can be can be really important not only to develop your identity and other leadership opportunities, but also to find smaller atmospheres to, to plug in and to get engaged. So I think I'm, I'm going to stop there. Uh, yeah, I'm going to stop there and take a breath if that's okay. <laughs> Thank you both for sharing your different perspectives. Um, at this point, um, Ali, I believe you may have the questions from either our attendees. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so I guess another plug for if you do have particular questions that you want to be sure are answered, um, please feel free to reach out. If this one doesn't look like I see any particular ones from the group. So I know Marty and I spent a lot of time talking about questions, and so um, maybe we can kind of start um, by sharing, like asking some of the questions that we have that kind of build on what you all shared, and then mm -hmm. as questions come in from the audience, we'll kind of launch into those. Um, Something that we were thinking a lot about, and I'm curious if you all can kind of speak to this, um, is being intentional about the networking, and so kind of taking a step back from the actual interactions that you have and trying to think through, as you all made decisions of who to network with, what kinds of goals led those just kind of networking attempts? You all kind of spoke to this a little bit, but just to maybe kind of consolidate some of that. Mm -hmm. Do you want to go ahead, Valina, or do you want me to go? Um, you can go ahead. I'm still working on it in the head. <laughs> me too, a little bit. But, um, you know, I think it, it depends on what my goal is. Um, if my goal is mentorship, for instance, then I, I'm intentional, um, you know, in the sense of what it is that I'm seeking or needing and who might be able to be supportive um, in that way. Some networking is just incidental, and, and there's, it's like, it's just happenstance. Um, and making good use of happenstance is, is really critical, I think, in, in networking. Um, and then when it's more to just um, build my connections, if, you know, again, what, what is it that I'm seeking? And in both of those cases, fit is really important, um, because I think that regardless of what type of relationship that we're talking about, if we're talking about a mentorship relationship, if we're talking about a peer relationship, we're still talking about relationships. And um, so when you are beginning a new relationship or you're reaching out to someone that, that it may establish some sort of professional relationship, um, that takes time, it takes energy, it takes resources, and you, you, know, you want it to be a positive experience. So the more that, for me, that I've had a sense of fit beforehand, um, is really helpful in terms of the best use of my time and energy, kind of like Valeen was saying, and you know, because there's there's some of that to joint or um, to building relationships as much as there is joining things. This is going to be you know, energy consuming. Is there a fit there that makes this a connection worth establishing or fostering? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would absolutely. Um agree with with the idea in particular about about fit um, I think I uh, so I will say I came out of the the latter part of my training and kind of the beginning of my my ACP hood whatever um, uh, feeling like I wanted to kind of explore everything and do everything and try all of these different you know oh this seems interesting oh that seems interesting and then you know, that I feel like in a lot of ways kind of ballooned when I moved to a very different type of setting um, when I moved um, from a counseling center to a VA um, because it was another whole new world. Uh, I, I think for me, um, in being intentional in networking, um, I, I try to ask myself, uh, first of all, what do I need from this networking opportunity? Um, and then I also think about what can I offer in this networking opportunity. Um, and that, 
sometimes it's I just need to be around people and I just need to be around psychologists who are thinking about professional issues. So for example, tonight I'm going to um, to a uh, like a social hour uh, through my state psych association and um, they're uh, kind of honoring and having a meet and greet with a local uh, state legislator. And in thinking about that opportunity for networking, I, I, I realized one of my needs is to learn more about what other things psychologists can do on a state level, particularly around um, politics and advocacy. We are living in a really yeah, time. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how else to say it. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a complicated time for a lot of different reasons. And, um, and uh, I know in grad school, I felt this particular fire to, to get involved in kind of political work in a particular way um, during Obama's um, election campaigns. And now I'm feeling a very different kind of pull. And I want to see what psychologists do outside of what I'm seeing in the VA or what I saw in other settings. So um, going into that opportunity and thinking about when I want to go to a particular activity or do a social hour, um, I, I want to think a lot about, okay, what am I going to get out of this? Like, what do I need to get out of this? But then also, like, what will I be able to bring? And I think for me also, my um, State Psych Association, you know, I'm, I'm involved with the Committee on Ethnic Minority Affairs and we're really wanting to um, encourage more opportunities for diversity, um, not only in leadership, but also in the general body of the um, association. And it's also important for me to give in terms of being an ECP and being a person of color and being that face who's there and saying like, I. I'm, you know, wanting to have a seat at this table too. I can bring particular skills and strengths and I'll be able to get back and, and kind of give. Yeah, it's, it's funny that you mention um, our unique time in socio-political history. Um, the, I was thinking a lot of other words, but. <laughs> yeah, yeah, those are probably the safest at the moment. Um, <laughs> And I was thinking about that in terms of like, you know, what, thinking about what I need again in, uh, in establishing networks and, and uh, taking network opportunities. And some of that can be multidisciplinary, um, which I think I underappreciated before. Um, some of that's just required, you know, I'm uh, the, the psychologist population and the, the counseling psychologist population is a little low where I live. Um, and so trying to find, uh, you know, allies has been important in a different way. And so I think, again, I underappreciated um, reaching out multidisciplinarily. And again, I was lucky. I mean, my, I, I literally live next to a professor of nursing who's very active. She connected me with a whole group of other people, which actually included a counseling psychologist that I didn't know was in the area. Um, and I wound up going in and doing advocacy training for, um, for two local groups um, who are trying to become more politically active, but in doing so, even though I was going in to provide some training, I, I wound up establishing a lot of connections that are, are really meaningful to me um, with folks from all different uh, professional walks of life, including um, you know, a former uh, congressperson and um, people who are being really politically active in their in their other types of roles and so um that was unexpected and um and wonderful and it's been a great source of support and learning for me so um sometimes the the thinking about what it is that i need at that time it's not even just being around psychologists but you know, being around people and uh people with similar uh values and goals and um and so I've been sort of constantly reminding myself that there's a lot to be learned from each other from, in a multidisciplinary sense and trying to more actively and intentionally engage that network. Yeah. I appreciate you both sharing your kind of reflections related to goals and intentionality. It's a good reminder that sometimes the networking goals and efforts are related to like having a particular professional question like Mel, you shared earlier about um, grant writing and wanting some kind of game skills related to that. And then other times, you were saying, Ellen, it's about I'm new to this area and I want to connect with people. And so I appreciate that the balance among sometimes it's kind of skill-based and like strategy-based and other times it's just about building relationships. 
which are equally as important given the hard work we do. So just appreciate you both sharing that. And it looks like we do have a question that came through. Um, I will kind of read it aloud, so let me know if you have any you need to repeat anything. Um, so it looks like we have somebody in our audience named Ashley um, who has a master's degree. Um, and so she wrote, um, this is her, I'm reading first person from her, um, I want to work with military personnel and veterans who have invisible wounds. I'm having a hard time finding a mentor to help me get from one step to the next which is a PhD program. How did you all get into your like respective graduate program? And how help, how helpful were those in your networks were those in your networks when applying to these schools? Um, yeah, I could speak to that. Um, so so for me actually um, coming out of my master's program, I so I I, I um, did four years of undergrad and then ended up having um, kind of getting um, um, accepted into my master's program while I was still in undergrad. So there was this period of time where I was taking master's level, like my master's courses in like the final years of my, the final year of my like undergrad. Um, so after that, I was like, I need a break. I, I want to figure out what else is out there. Um, and I ended up getting hired at um, the VA in Baltimore, Maryland, which is where I'm from, um, and um, do, doing some work there with um, veterans who have uh, dual, uh, dual diagnoses. And I think for me that was really what sparked my um, interest and desire to work with veterans. And um, it, it came from actually connecting with somebody who was doing research or doing kind of particular kind of investigative work around veteran, around kind of veterans' experiences. Um, in terms of uh, networking, um, I know within Division 17 there had been a, a special interest group on um, a mili a military kind of culture and working with military families and um, working with veteran populations, um, military issues, I believe I can't recall what the exact name of it is. Um, and so certainly that would be uh, one place to check and connect in. Um, reaching out to counseling psychologists who are um, in VAs would also be another uh, important option. And there are different uh, service organizations where you might even be able to do volunteer work. That might be a way to connect with and um, start to, to find opportunities to connect with uh, um, organizations that support veterans or that support military families, depending on what part of the country you're in. Um, so it doesn't have to just be psychology. I mean, I think you could have, you could have kind of like a two-pronged approach in the sense that you could think about networking opportunities to get you to grad school and um, to help to connect you with somebody who's doing that kind of work on the grad school end, but then also um, networking opportunities to connect with the general work around working with veterans and military families, which could look very different. So I, I hope that did that kind of generally cover some of the points. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, and I would add that, um, you know, I can't speak to the military psychology side of it at all, but to the getting into a PhD program side of it, if that's the, the, the goal to, like, the path that you want to take to that end goal, um, you know, thinking, thinking thoroughly about how you might want to approach the research side of that, because that will be a huge part of admissions to a PhD program is, um, how you're orienting your research and how you're thinking and talking about research. And so I think if you can connect with, um, with potential mentors around um, shared research interests, I think there's a lot of, a lot of faculty members around who, um, who would be willing to be helpful about you know, how to sort of prepare for the graduate admissions process specifically around your, um, your research interests because that's going to shape what your application looks like. So you want, like, you can seek mentorship specifically around getting into a PhD program, um, but getting into a PhD program specifically around your research interests is also a particular type of mentorship. And um, so seeking out those faculty who are doing research in areas that you're interested in and trying to um, connect with them if you are at, you know, the APA convention or, um, and 
in the Division 17 suite area, or I think um, Division 29 is military psychology, is that right? Uh, 19 is military psych, Nine. 18 has a section on VAs, and I think those are all the, yeah, that's it. Yeah. So if you find academicians with um, areas of research interest that overlap with yours in 17 in some of those other divisions, um, that would be a good place to start. Thank you both. A little bit of um, what you were describing was bringing up another question for me, which is around kind of reflections that you all have had about networking with peers versus networking with uh, maybe more advanced. Um, professionals. I'm just curious, just generally, about reflections about that and decision making that you all have made, or things that you've noticed being different, or what you've learned about them, the differences between the two, and how you've decided who to network with and how. Yeah. So your your language around that reminds me that you know we were we sort of talked via email before before this about how um, how fluid networking yeah. tends to be. Um, in fact, I kind of have to do almost like a retroactive process to go back and label it networking, you know. Um, like, oh yeah, that is what happened. Um, mm -hmm. Because it's it's just connecting with other other humans on a similar path with, with shared interests-ish interests -ish, and, um, and who are in similar stages of, of their career. You know, um, a lot of that connection for me with peers uh, in a similar sort of career stage has been around joining and has been around getting involved. You know, for me, um, joining the ECP committee, for instance, um, which was was and is sanity providing for me many times. Um, you know, I'm the the incoming or the chair elect of the ECP committee. Uh, Valine is past chair of the ECP committee, um, and so we've we've overlapped. Uh, you know, quite a quite a few years now on the committee, I guess, and. Um, you know, just uh, having that connection uh, with people who are experiencing similar struggles and similar challenges. And I think even she and I being, for instance, on very different sort of, I guess, sides of counseling psychology, being a full-time practitioner in a VA versus being um, an, an academic, there's still shared challenges. And so, um, you know, I knew in trying to join the ECP committee that there's a chance it could be sanity providing to to have colleagues that I can uh, that I can connect with around some of those challenges and um, you know talk with openly about those things and indeed that's that's been the case so that was my goal in in trying to um, establish those connections through a formal route um, but uh, in the end establish what are what are truly relationships and. Um, I think same thing when we when we do ECP functions, for instance, at the Division 17 conference. Um, a lot of it is around trying to establish those peer relationships, and um, I don't know that there's um, I don't know a lot of intentional decision making around that at the time from some of those more informal social type of opportunities. Um, yeah, as much as it is just broadly seeking connection for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And showing up, right, physically being there, like making yeah. the decision to attend something like that. Yeah. Yeah, I um, I agree that the ECP committee has been has been a source of sanity for me too. <laughs> um, and I um, so I had mentioned earlier as well, thinking about opportunities to join things and whatever joining things is going to look like for you is certainly going to be important. Um, for me, a lot of kind of peer uh, focused networking um, meant making those new connections, but also making sure I held on to the connections that I had made for other reasons that weren't networking related. So I've, I've probably at this point mentioned quite a lot my, um, my, my postdoc program um, coming here in my first year and uh, the uh, training program for postdoctoral residency here is particularly big. It's ballooned a lot in the last few years. So my cohort coming in my first year was 17 people, um, which is a lot bigger than the like three to five person cohort I was used to on internship. Um, so that means that you're not necessarily going to be best friends with everybody. You're going to naturally make closer connections with some people and then there are going to be other people who 
um, you know, it may be a little bit easier to kind of uh, let let drift out of your life. Um, and some folks you want to keep them drifted, but some folks, some folks you never know how they're going to resurface. Um, and in my case, there was somebody who I respected quite a lot. Um, really appreciated her perspective on kind of social justice work and she had left the VA and I had stayed um, and uh, maybe about a year or two after our, our training year together um, I responded to an email um, that was kind of a calling all ECPs to get involved with um, planning the state psych associations conference and it turned out that she was on the, the um, she was one of the co-chairs for the planning committee so for me, you know, I think it, it was an opportunity not only to like to network with her and to, to kind of reopen that channel, but to learn a little bit more about her interests and what she ended up doing leaving the VA and um, kind of what other professional opportunities to, to get involved with. And, and that went a long way for me getting connected into my state psych association. So it's, it's not just about the new connections you make, it's also about making sure you're fostering and nurturing the, the old ones you want to continue to keep. That's such a good reminder about the importance of the relationship. I mean, it feels so obvious, like, as you all are talking, and yet, um, at least for me, when I think about the idea of networking, it feels like this intimidating process where I need to craft the perfect email or have the perfect intro sentence. Um, and yet when you really break it down, it's about relationships and building relationships um, and staying connected with people. So we so appreciate the example that you all are sharing. Um, it looks like another question came in. Um, so I'm going to read through that one too. Also reading on um, the language that that person submitted. Um, so it says, I am a woman of color as well. My challenges include finding a mentor who understands cultural challenges within the current socio-political context and balancing working as a team while demonstrating individual strengths for potential leadership roles. Any reflections or suggestions and or suggestions? Wow, I feel like, did, did I write that question? I just, I feel like that speaks so much to my experience. Thank you for, <laughs> thank you for that. Um, I can really identify with a lot of what the, the um, uh, attendee was, was sharing. Um, for me, as a woman of color, working in a predominantly white, predominantly male space and institution, it was incredibly important to, to stay connected with mentors of color, and particularly like mentors who were women of color um, that, that I had already connected with in grad school and in other, other spaces where they were more plentiful, um, even if they weren't doing the same thing that I was doing. So I'm, I'm very fortunate in that um, I had amazing mentorship in grad school. My um, former advisor still takes an active interest in what I'm doing, even though I, God forbid, went into a practice-focused career and did not end up in academia, which in some instances can be a little bit of a bad word. Um, and I'm, I'm really grateful for that because I think that that went a long way to shaping for me um, how important mentorship can be. But she also was a really wonderful model um, in terms of networking. Um, Mel, I know you had mentioned at like conferences kind of feeling like, oh, I'm going to want to talk to this person and, um, and being mindful of that when you're introducing now your own students or other people that you're with. And um, so I think certainly finding people who can do that for you is going to be incredibly important. Um, making sure you're connected in with uh, spaces that reflect you as a woman of color, um, also incredibly important. Um, spaces like ABSI, certainly Association of Black Psychologists, um, NLPA for Latino women. Um, AAPA, Asian American Psych Association. Um, I'm sure there are other ones that I am forgetting. The, the Society of Indian Psychologists. Thank you. Yes, yeah, Society of Indian Psychologists, absolutely. And um, thinking about how those spaces can continue to, to nurture you. Um, those spaces might also be intersectional. So, you know, there may be an intersection with gender, sexual orientation, maybe. Um, religious and spiritual kind of perspectives as well. Um, and I would go back to what Mel had mentioned before, which was be bold. Um, my experience has been with other 
women of color, psychologists that I've wanted to connect with, they know what it feels like to be the only, they know what it feels like to be isolated, and um, many of them are very receptive to an email, to some type of intro, to some connection, just saying, hey, I'm reaching out, I really need some support, is there some way I can talk to you, can I get some guidance, can I get some advice, can you help to connect me with this other person? Certainly, I don't want to paint a picture that it's just going to be like sunshine and lollipops and it's going to be that easy. Um, and I have surprised myself as somebody who is a little more shy and introverted. Um, I've been surprised at how, you know, giving people can be in terms of networking. Mm -hmm. I have a lot to say on that. Sorry. <laughs> a lot of air time. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. It makes me reflect a little bit too on a lot of what I heard you saying, which I think is incredibly helpful, is kind of identifying spaces um, and people where you do feel burned and almost kind of creating that community for yourself. So um, you can kind of talk through and think through and get support in your kind of professional career trajectory. The other thing this question makes me think about, um, and I hope the attendees who have the question will be okay with me um, kind of building on it, is the fact that through networking, whether it's as a graduate student, as an early career person, or even throughout your career, part of what we're always navigating is power dynamics. And so I'm curious if you all have reflections on, um, in whatever way kind of fits for you, lessons learned about navigating power dynamics mm -hmm. in networking, not broadly. So it's a massive yeah. question, but in we networking for quite a while. Yeah. Quite a while. Uh, <laughs> You know, I do, I want to say two things. One of them kind of building off of um, what Valine shared is, you know, one of the things that I was struck by is just that, you know, it's so important to have have a mentor as a jumping off point, you know, someone who, who will make those introductions. And, um, and sometimes it does require being a little bit extra bold, unfortunately, when you are the only, um, you know, I, uh, I think that, you know, for instance, I'm in the, the silly position of being the, the kind of um, the primary mentor for our students of color uh, because there are not really models here for that. So, um, and I'm, I'm happy to, to serve as that mentor and there are some parts of the experience that I'm just never going to be able to understand, right? So, um, my first referral is usually to ABCI or, or uh, NLPA or other other organizations like that um, and I think that's you know an example of a way that I've learned to try to use my to minimize power dynamics to use my, my power dynamics for good to make introductions um, when I know uh, other other potential mentors who are in ABCI or who are in NLPA and try to make those connections um, because I know what it feels like to be on the other side of the power dynamic and even though I'm more extroverted I'm still I'm still really nervous and shy sometimes so um, I know how hard it was for me as um, as a student or even as a new graduate, uh, to, not that it's been that long, to uh, to jump in and make those connections for myself. So I try my best to, um, to help make those connections for others. But um, when I haven't had someone to make those connections for me, uh, it, it has just come down to trying to get out of my head in terms of the power dynamics because they often not always, but often feel worse or, or look worse in my head than they really are. Like I, like I said earlier, I get in that like, who am I space? Who am I to be speaking to this person, to be jumping into this conversation, to, to be speaking up um, because I'm in my head about where I am in the, in the power dynamic and in some hierarchy that I've, I've constructed. And um, that again, sometimes does exist, uh, you know, legitimately, but if I can get out of my head for a minute, one of two things is going to happen. Um, either I'm going to be bold and establish a connection that is going to be great, that wouldn't have happened if I weren't bold and didn't try to step out of my head for a second, or it's going to go poorly. And I've learned that that's not someone that I want to connect with uh, if it goes poorly because of power. If someone has the reaction to me that was the reaction in my head, which was, who are you to be talking to me or, you know, it, why is this happening right now? 
that's probably not someone that I want to build a relationship with anyway. Um, and so I try to remind myself of that when I'm trying to talk myself into being bold and recognizing that most, most of the time it doesn't go poorly. Uh, the power dynamic feels worse to me than, than it actually exists in the environment or will be perceived by the person that I'm trying to connect with. But if I'm wrong about that, then I'm going to learn something. Um, and that's important in its own way too. Do you have anything additional you want to share, Valerie? Yeah, I just don't want to transition before you. Yeah, I, I think maybe the the only um, the only thing that I would add, I, um, as Mel was talking, it was making me think of the conversation that we had just before we started the call about the the fine line or the ways that um, networking and mentoring can kind of merge together. Um, so sometimes networking is for the purposes of connecting with the mentor and sometimes mentoring is for the purposes of facilitating networking and so it can be a little bit of a double-edged sword. Um, and with regards to um, power dynamics, um, I, I would maybe, I would, I would add, you know, not to not to undersell what you are bringing to the networking opportunity and what you are bringing to the relationship. Um, there have been times where um, I have wanted to network as somebody early in my career and I am proud of my many <clears throat> personal and professional identities including my identity as an ECP and um, I have also found that sometimes being in a room with people who are further along in their career for whom like the ECP mon moniker and everything is kind of a newer concept, um, it, it may end up um, with people kind of pushing me aside or thinking that I want a mentor when in actuality I want to make this professional connection to move forward with the leadership opportunity or move forward in, in my professional career in some ways. And so um, I, I would agree with what, what Mel said, you know, trust when you feel that in a particular connection with somebody that that, that might be a sign, maybe that person is not going to be the person you want to network with right now, or maybe you want to network with them for a very specific reason later. But certainly don't, um, don't you know, um, undersell your, your valuable opportunity, especially if somebody are early in your career. <coughs> This reflection. Part of me is also just wanting to be attentive to time. Um, and I know we have a few things we want to do in closing, but it looks like maybe we have time for about one more question. Um, so I kind of want to pause to see if anyone submits any additional questions. So if folks in the audience don't necessarily have questions, um, I know I have another one. I think maybe I'll ask my question. Something that um, I know Marty and I were reflecting on quite a bit is um, maybe how preparation, that being, ooh, I take that back. It looks like we did get a question. Okay. Um, I'll ask my question to you all later. Um, okay. So, so far, the first sentence is this is an excellent, this is excellent advice for how to network. So, thank you both. Um, being bold is easier for me when I'm interested in a topic. How do you suggest beginning psychologists in training, students and applicants to graduate school, not be too bold though? Are they are there any rules for what not to do when starting to build your network or just reach out and network? That's a really good question. Not to do. That's yeah. a good question. Yeah. Kind of on the flip side of the yeah. I'm talking about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so I think maybe one thing that I can that I can offer is um, I guess I would probably want to go back and, and um, revisit that idea of being intentional with your networking. And um, <clears throat> there's a part of me that when I heard the question, I was like, "There is no such thing as too bold." And, and I was like, "Oh wait, yeah, maybe sometimes you know, there's that one person who is like, okay, maybe maybe you're being a little." doing a little too much. Um, so, so I certainly think um, uh, being aware not only of what you want and what is the intention of your networking opportunity, like the networking you're pursuing, but also um, 
um, being being mindful of what that might look like, what that request or that need might look like in your interaction with somebody else. Um, and uh, I, I, I am aware that there have been times where I have thought that maybe I didn't show up enough or maybe I wasn't bold and flashy enough or I wasn't talking enough for asking particular questions. Um, and it's turned out that there is something else that I've done or some other way that I've contributed that has been valuable and people have noticed that, people have seen that. Um, and uh, there have been times where people that I've worked with have been a little too bold and a little too outspoken and that can sometimes rub people the wrong way. So I think just being being intentionally bold and intentionally daring to me seems seems like something that, that I would offer. I, mean, I wouldn't go like chasing people that, oh, I think we lost Marty. Um, I wouldn't go chasing people down at conferences, but uh, yeah, that's, that's all I'll say for now. <laughs> yeah. Oh, welcome back, Marty. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I agree. I agree with everything Valine said. Um, and I think that, you know, a lot of it comes down to just remembering that it's relational, you know, and so I think there's there's intentionality, but there's and there's you know having some sense of impact on others in terms of how you're bold, you know, because um, I think the the piece of boldness is that I think a good proportion of us who who get into this field can be um, you know sometimes self-reflective to a fault and um, you know good quality necessary quality and keeps you in your head right um, and so it's about that you know not staying in your head to the point that the opportunity passes you by, you know, and rather than, you know, should I even say hello to this person? Should I even send an email? Just say it, just say hello, just introduce yourself, just send the email. Um, you know, and I think as long as you are, you know, clear about why you're reaching out and um, respectful about it and use your relational skills, then I think within that context, there's no such thing as too bold. I had kind of the same uh, same reaction as Valine of like, what? That's, no, be as bold as you can possibly be. Um, but, you know, I suppose there, is a, there is such a thing as too much. And so um, I think if you, within that context, within the context of relational skills, within the context of intentionality, um, there I think that, that the boldness is um, important and, uh, I can't think of the word I'm looking for, but acceptable, basically. Um, and I think something that the only, the only thing I can think of that that I can that I've seen is the the networking with intentionality to a fault, right? Like I need this thing from you, and and that that's my goal. I need something, or you know, I there's some way that you other person can be useful to me. That's not relational, right? Um, that's utility, and and I think while utility is is realistic within a relational context, that's mm -hmm. that's the important piece. Um, this is a fostering relationship task, so in that context, boldness is good. Absolutely. All right. I that. Um, yeah, I I do as well. Um, also being sensitive to time today, um, I want to go ahead and wrap us up. I appreciate um, y'all answering answering that very final question, which was very good. Um, I want to close us out by first um, extending gratitude to Dr. Lance and Dr. Whitaker for um, serving as panelists for today's presentation. Um, I learned a lot, and I hope you as um, attendees learned a lot as well. Also, on behalf of the East Division 17 ECP Committee, we would like to extend our thank you to you, the attendees, for taking the time out of your very busy, busy schedule to attend this event today. Um, at any point in time, if there are follow-up questions or anything that you need from us as a committee, particularly myself and Allie, please feel free to email us um, because we recognize that this is just the beginning of a discussion that could go on for hours and hours. But we, will, we won't keep you that long today. Um, and so we want to um, extend our gratitude and appreciation to you all. Um, a final note is that if you are interested in further networking, leadership opportunities, becoming involved in the division, um, we encourage you to continue participation in not only in our webinars but our other events. And so please stay tuned to the Division 17 ECP webpage as well as the, just the Division 17 listserv and um, webpage itself for more information about how to get involved. Um, because as we have indicated throughout this presentation today, 
one of the primary ways to networking is being bold and putting yourself out there. And that can happen primarily through leadership and community um, building with other psychologists. And so with that being said, I would like to thank you all for your time today and hope you all have a great rest of the afternoon. Bye-bye. Thanks for having us. Thank you.